Hello, Houston. For the next five days, we are going to hear how God's call, God's love, God's grace, and God's hope changes everything. And we will live in the new life of Jesus who has changed everything. You are going to be the alternative face of Christianity. You are now going to join God's resistance. And God's resistance is love. Love that is stronger than hate, stronger than evil, stronger even than death. You are God's resistance. I went with my friend to this dinner that was held once a week for college students at the Lutheran Church. I was going to hold on to my Hindu self with every fiber of my being. It's what I knew. It's, it's how I grew up. I was ready to march right into that church, getting ready to defend my right to exist. And I didn't have to. I was welcomed. The pastor said he wasn't out to convert me. It was just a group of students who had dinner together. They hung out and I was welcome to join them. So I did. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. God-given gift, like our gathering scripture says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, for it is by grace. Which makes me wonder, is God's grace for everyone or just a select few? Is it the stranger on the street, the immigrant in your school, that person across the political aisle? As a church, I think we've always struggled with this. We've struggled with people who continuously push our boundaries and our ideas of grace. And the Bible is full of stories that don't just push us, but shatters our ideas of grace. I think we all know that the world and its people need us. It needs us to be courageous to walk alongside people in those difficult moments. And it needs us to have fierce commitment to walk alongside people, especially when the things of this life crush their very souls and humanity. But perhaps what they don't need us to do is fix their problems or even try to save their worlds. What people need us to do is love. Love those who look and sound and believe different things than us. Love people who serve causes that we may not understand. We love people so that we, they might know that their lives are a gift, that their lives matter, and that they are never alone. God doesn't give us hardships. He doesn't decide the time or place something unfortunate will happen. Instead, God promises to be there. God promises to put the right people in our lives. He promises to put the right people in our lives to help us, to give us strength, and to love us always. It's hard to understand the magnitude of my fight, but these beads help me to tell my story. They each stand for one medical procedure I've been through. In four short years, I've collected more than 4,000 beads. My string of beads stretches over 45 feet long. Each represents a moment in my battle when I had to push past the pain, the tears, and the heartache and trust that God would get me through this. While my friends went to school, I went to the hospital. I've spent my days in hospital waiting rooms watching Paw Patrol with five-year-olds or AARP commercials with 80-year-olds. It was in those moments that I've never felt more alone 
in my entire life. I felt like the world was trying to break me, but one day my heart started to change. God wanted me to wake up and realize that I didn't have to feel angry, isolated, and afraid. I came to realize that God was working in me to help others face their own tragedies, and in return, they were helping me to tackle mine. God's grace is not only about forgiveness, but also about the way that God leads us into the person that we will become. I was a freshman in high school when I started cutting. On the surface, I looked like I had it all together. I was a solid A and B student. I was involved in sports, theater, choir. I was active in my church. I had a lot of friends. I also struggled with anxiety and depression but I didn't have a name for that yet. So I figured I should talk to my pastor and I shared with him the hurt and the shame and the fear that I'd been carrying for all these years. And with four words, he broke me. You're going to hell. Four words, but they confirmed everything I'd ever been afraid of. I was broken and there was no hope of fixing me. So I walked away from the church. Eventually I sat down with Pastor Carla and for the second time I shared this story and I was terrified what she was going to say when I finished. Pastor Carla listened, and then she also said four words. There's grace for that. Our God is in the business of bringing beauty out of broken things and broken people. There's a word for when our tears turn to joy. There's a word for when our own pain is a balm for those who also hurt. There's a word for when our failings are redeemed into something beautiful. And that word, my Lutheran friends, is grace. God isn't waiting for you to become thinner or more spiritual or better athlete to love you. I think the more distracted we become by our projects of self-improvement, the less we really even experience the love of God because we're too busy trying to earn what's already been freely given to us. So here's the deal. Your ideal self is not real. You are. You and all your inconsistencies and beauty, you and your sinner and saintness, you God beloved, you are magnificently imperfect. I need that kind of mercy and forgiveness more than I need to hold resentments. I need that kind of mercy and forgiveness more than I need to be self-righteous. Because self-righteousness feels good for a minute, you know, but only in the way that like peeing your pants feels warm for a minute, you know? <laughs> and then it goes cold and <laughs> it doesn't smell good. You understand grace is why we have Christian community. You know that, right? Because we help each other shut the voices up. We tend to each other's wounds. We show each other our scars. We see and forgive each other's shortcomings. We let each other cry. We make each other laugh and are absolutely adamant about grace for everyone. We insist on freeing each other from the chains of the accusing voice. And we totally have a secret weapon to break those chains because Jesus of Nazareth was a chain breaking man. My daughter went viral. She's 11 years old. She loves to dance, 
mountain bike, and hang out with her friends. Her teachers think she's an angel. Her two little brothers disagree. <laughs> she's a pastor's kid. She loves to acolyte and sing in the choir. She's also transgender. That means that when she was born, everyone thought she was a boy, but she deeply knows herself to be a girl. On the 10th anniversary of her baptism, we gathered with friends, family, godparents, and our church community to celebrate her as a called and claimed child of God, blessing her and her forever name, Rebecca Eleanor. Rebecca? Being transgender just means being myself. It means being who God made me to be. Why? Why did I have to go through all of this when none of my friends did? Did God mess up? I've come to learn that God does not make mistakes. I was created in the image of God to be me. I show up every day at school, field hockey, at church to remind everyone that transgender kids are just like other kids. We need to be loved and supported. I've learned I've learned that by being who God has called me to be and by telling my story, hearts and minds are changed. We don't have to wait till we're all grown up to make an impact. We can be hope for the church and for all people. They need us. People always tell me I'm brave for being myself. Maybe, but I hope that the church is a place where everyone can bravely be themselves in all their uniqueness to be safe and loved. My congregation loves and supports me, but that's just the first step in becoming a faith community that truly welcomes all people. Not only the young leaders of tomorrow, you are the leaders of today, right here, right now. And I want to tell you, you are here for a purpose and a reason. We, in our vibrant variety, form one family and help turn God's house into a home. When we take that hospitality at home, everywhere we go with the word of welcome, not just on Sunday morning, but 24 seven in our schools saying you have a purpose, in our jails saying you have a purpose, in our streets saying you have a purpose, then we are no longer only in a church building, but we are building church. If you hear nothing else, hear me say, you were born to make an indelible mark on the world that no one can erase. And if you don't make that mark, that mark won't be made. Here is the wonderful news, why we can still sing hallelujah when it looks impossible, when you've gone from your place and maybe you're the only three or four Lutherans in your high school. Remember this, but remember most of all, Jesus has changed everything. Amen.